work satisfaction and motivation. Individuals spend a large part of their waking hours and their life at work and in executing work tasks. Therefore, it's important to experience a sense of satisfaction with what you spend your time on in the workplace. To feel work satisfaction, meaningfulness, stimulation and motivation to execute work tasks and activities in working life. A part of this is understanding and be able to see the organisation, enterprise and activities in workplace on the whole. To see and understand how your own effort, engagement, time, force and energy spent on executing work tasks amount to an important piece of the puzzle in the organisation and in the workplace. Without your effort, the result would not be as good and something would be missing. To experience that what you perform in your work and work tasks make, makes a difference to the organisation and workplace is important in order to feel motivated and to execute your work every day. It's important that employees don't feel alienated from the final product of the enterprise as an easily replaceable cog in the machinery of the organization, but rather to feel that their own effort and work tasks amount to an important contribution to the enterprise, the organization, municipality, county or authority where you work, as well as to society. The employee needs to feel a sense of pride of their own work and how it's executed and meaningfulness in the work tasks. No one feels good about going to a job every day that feels pointless. Salary is an acknowledgement of a work well done. However, a salary is rarely a sufficient motivational factor for well-being in the workplace or a sense of satisfaction with the work tasks. Motivation increases with increased understanding of the own work task significance in the work team, for co-workers and for the goals of the activities in the workplace, for the organisation or enterprise's productivity, financial gain, goals and successes. As a task in society, for the maintenance of societal functions, for the common welfare, development as well as for the future. Motivation increases through own areas of responsibility in the workplace. Through being clear on the overall aim of the organisation and how the work tasks of an individual employee contributes to achieve this, managers and management can contribute to the individual's well-being with the tasks in the workplace. Motivation is important to a sustainable working life for all ages. Research shows that individuals who experience a sense of satisfaction, meaningfulness and stimulation when executing their work tasks and in their occupations want to keep working in the workplace and to work until an older age to a larger extent. Some even identify so strongly with executing the work tasks that they enjoy that they have a hard time imagining ever leaving working life. They experience that the possibilities the tasks provide that may involve problem solving and find being able to use the skills, knowledge and creativity so rewarding that they cannot imagine life without it. They perceive their occupation and work tasks as a very important part of their life, their identity and their well-being. They believe that the tasks make a difference in the workplace for the organisation, enterprise and society, or even for the world. They experience appreciation for what they perform and achieve. They experience a lack of stimulation and meaningfulness if they don't receive the possibility to, de to perform these tasks. At the same time, Dissatisfaction with work tasks is a problem both to productivity 
and the well-being of the individual employee. One may feel fed up with the years of executing the exact same task. One may execute the work tasks without being aware of how this contributes to someone else's well-being, so that the enterprise can produce and increase the revenue that it contributes to others being able to execute their respective work tasks, that their own work effort and tasks amount to an important cog in the machinery of the organization, without which the results would worsen or maybe even stop altogether without the contribution of the individual employee and their work tasks. Maybe the core of the occupation and work tasks that once made the employee choose an occupation has changed over the years. The content of work tasks and activities may not even comply with what the employee believed to be when they applied for the job. Or maybe, due to reorganizations and changes, they have received work tasks that don't correspond to what the employee really wants to execute and spend the time on. Administration may have taken a larger proportion of the tasks so that the employee does not experience having time to or being able to perform their actual work tasks in a manner that satisfies them. Technological issues may result in not being able to execute work tasks in the way the employee wishes or to be of a quality that the employee pride themselves on and want to achieve. Research shows that factors such as these may contribute to the employee wanting to leave working life, the workplace, and maybe spend their time doing something completely different, such as working in a different workplace, or if they have the possibility to do more exciting tasks and activities in their leisure time, they may leave working life altogether and retire. There are different theories on what and how to influence employees' motivation, sense of meaningfulness, stimulation and well-being with occupational activities and work tasks. These are, for example, the Effort Reward Imbalance, ERI for short, the Demand Control Model, the Sense of Coherence, SOC for short, Empowerment and Nudging. ERI is short for Effort Reward Imbalance, the balance between the effort put into something and the reward it yields. It's the theory commonly used with the concept of performance-based self-esteem. The theory was introduced by Johannes Sigrist, Professor of Occupational Stress at the University of Düsseldorf in order to examine what causes cardiovascular diseases. The occupational role is central in people's lives. The effort put in work through physical exertion, mental effort, working hours, which sometimes include working overtime, and the work pace. The employee must, can, and want to work in, needs to be rewarded in some sense so that the individual experience satisfaction and recognition for their effort. Effort and reward builds on the social no norm of reciprocity and balance. Effort reward consists of explicit parts like salary, promotions and career possibilities as reward and compensation for the effort. However, there are also explicit parts that are of great importance, such as appreciation and acknowledgement. An imbalance between effort and reward causes stress and stress reactions. A problematic balance can, for example, be that an employee feels that they put a lot of time, effort and energy in the work in relation to what they get in return through salary, appreciation and a feeling that they enjoy themselves.
there are individual differences in the experience of effort and reward balance. An important task is to try and see what is more objective and can be caused by how work is organized and what is more subjective and related to how the individual interprets situations and are affected by them. Sigrist has produced a questionnaire that measures the balance between the sense of effort and reward. There's a risk of ill health, especially if there's one, an imbalance between high effort in work and low reward, which increases the risk of ill health to a higher degree than just high effort or just low reward. Two, overcommitment increases the risk of negative health effects. Three, the highest risk of ill health is present for individuals with a high stress index combined with overcommitment. An imbalance in the workplace can cause illness or issues, especially when individuals have a need to display their competence and receive acknowledgement from their surroundings, or a self-esteem and self-image that to a high rate is set by their work tasks and the response the individuals get in their work. These are some of the parts of what is included in the concept of performance-based self-esteem. Individuals with a high commitment and a high need for feedback or appreciation run a high risk for tension and imbalance of effort and reward and have an increased vulnerability. A person with developed performance-based self-esteem that thereby have difficult balance between the experience of effort and reward are definitely in the danger zone of developing ill health or stress-related overload, overload and exhaustion. Karasek and Theorel describe in the book Healthy Work from 1991 that demand and effort in the work affect the work and the execution of work tasks and activities. The supporting idea for the demand controlled support model is that the effects of the mental demands put on the employee relate to how much control, scope for decision making and scope for actions they have. When the dimension of support was added to the demand control model through Johnson in 1986, the model showed to describe in a good way how social support can compensate for some of the shortcomings of the organization through putting too high demands on employees with a low rate of own control of the work task and activities. High mental demands increases the risk of illness caused by stress reactions, if there at the same time is a lack of social support or lack of control to influence the organization and the execution of their own work tasks. The possibility for an individual to experience well-being in this situation and with their work tasks increases if they feel part of a context that's understandable and meaningful. Sociologist Aaron Antonovsky, born in the US but for the larger part of his life active in Israel, studied among other things the state of health of Jewish women that had survived the concentration camps of the Second World War. He found that many were in sound health and experienced well-being 
despite the hardships and traumatic events they had suffered. He interviewed and analysed what these people had in common and developed a theory that aimed to explain how this could be. The theory is focused on the concept of salutogenesis, a medical approach that focuses on factors that promote health and well-being. In other words, what makes individuals able to experience well-being despite the terrible hardships they have endured? And is it possible to strengthen this in individuals? According to Antonovsky, the health of an individual depends on the individual's possibility to a sense of coherence, or SOC for short. According to Antonovsky, the sense of coherence determines how an individual copes with stressful situation and in turn affects well-being. The possibility of experiencing a sense of coherence in life and working life is based on three parts. Comprehensibility, in other words, a sense of what's happening, both inside and outside the individual, that is comprehensively structured and predictable. Manageability, which in this case means that the resources need, needed in order to handle events that take place in the surroundings are sufficient and available. Meaningfulness in life, which an individual experiences if they feel that the challenges they meet are worth engaging in. It's possible to measure the rate of sense of coherence. High values indicate that the individual has an ability to cope with varying challenges and are more likely to experience well-being and not be as affected by different stressful and pressuring situations. The three parts should not be viewed as separate. It's in the interplay between them that a sense of coherence is created. According to Antonovsky himself, the part of meaningfulness is the most important one. An individual who experiences their life as meaningful will plow away in tough situations, even in situations that seem unclear. Therefore, in working life, it's important that employees experience meaningfulness in order to be motivated to work and produce and to experience well-being in their work situation. The term empowerment has been used frequently in management since the 1980s, but has spread to organisational development and competence development. The concept of learned helplessness is used in organisational and behavioural psychology to describe what happens when individuals are deprived the possibility of deciding in their own lives and in their work tasks. Learned helplessness can be said to be the opposite of empowerment. The aim of empowerment is that the individual should feel that they have the power of their own situation, their work tasks, their close environment, etc. In other words, the individual should have the power of personal, socio-economic and environmental factors that affect the own individual and, the, and their situation. In healthcare, the term is used to describe methods like health coaching conversations to help an individual improve their health and support the individual to make choices that promote better health and follows an ordination or treatment. In social care, empowerment is used to strengthen individual's self-esteem in order to be able to resist and not choose to lapse into drug addiction and to resist criminal gang influences.
the individual receive written or oral information and based on earlier knowledge and the new knowledge, the individual makes a decision on the situation in order to improve their health. The choice or decisions of the individual doesn't need to be correct decisions according to others. What's significant is that the individual feels empowerment so that they can improve their health. In enterprises or organizations where employees feel that they cannot influence the, their work situation, this usually results in decreased motivation to work, carelessness when executing work tasks, bad treatment of patients, students, clients and customers, as well as low efficiency. Therefore, it's of interest to the, for everyone that organizations have a solid support for employees to feel a strong sense of empowerment as opposed to learned helplessness. Nudging is, simply put, a mental nudge in a direction that makes a person choose one alternative over another. Thereby, it's a policy instrument for individuals both in society and in workplaces. The theory behind the concept is that people usually know what is the right or best thing to do. However, we don't always make rational and measured decisions, but rather make many of our decisions on routine based on old habits, even if we know better. Humans usually have problems with self-control succumb to te temptations, procrastinate, or do what everyone else does. We know that it's good for us to maintain a healthy diet, exercise, study, be goal-oriented and productive at work, but we don't always do it. Therefore, individuals can sometimes need help to make the right decision through nudging, a small push in the right direction. When the Dutch airport Schiphol had a problem with men standing up and urinating and not being very careful to aim at the urinal, nudging was used through painting a small fly at the bottom of the urinal. This resulted in the urine outside the urinal to decrease by 80% when the men had something to aim at. The experiment at Schiphol was the start of what was to be called nudging when two American researchers decided to investigate why the fly had such a great effect. Behavioral economist Richard Thaler and Professor Cass Sunstein described how we all can become better people and make wiser decisions if we are nudged. Richard Thaler was awarded with the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2017 for, among other things, his theories on nudging. Nudging is usually described in positive terms since it can be used to influence people to make choices that are good for them or to society. It can be to place fruits at the cashier to make people choose an apple instead of candy or to paint footsteps on the pavement towards a waste bin in order to decrease litter. Nudging can also be used to help people change behaviours. For example, complicate smoking through referring to smokers' corners or to serve food on smaller plates to trick the eye that you eat more than you actually do. In order to make the small nudges from leaders in society or in a workplace, work, and to make individuals act in the right direction. There needs to be an experience in the individuals that they have a free choice. It's also important to perceive their own effort as meaningful and how it's a part of a larger context in order to be motivated and execute the task well. If we, for example, sympathize with the idea of a better environment. We accept to sort our wastes, for example. However, 
the acceptance is also affected by who takes advantage of the nudge. If there's a reward for ourselves, it's more likely that we will accept it than if society or the workplace has something to gain by us putting extra energy on doing something. Nudges that provide individual advantages are also experienced as less restrictive of the free choice. In the book, Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth and Happiness, the concept is described as follows. Any aspect of the choice architecture that alters the per people's behaviour in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. To count as a mere nudge, the intervention must be easy and cheap to avoid. Nudges are not mandates. Putting fruit at eye level counts as a nudge. Banning junk food does not. In order to increase employees' motivation, the managers and management can display the significance of the work tasks and work effort in a larger context through perceiving their own work tasks in relation to the work unit, the organization or enterprise, or to society. Increase the conditions to feel meaningful, experience work satisfaction and stimulation to execute work tasks. As a manager, another way to make employees feel proud and motivated when executing their work tasks is to describe and deepen the understanding of the historical background of the work, the significance of reaching the goals of the organization and how the work tasks and occupation is meaningful to the work team and in relation to competitors or similar organizations. Ensure that everyone feels and knows the role they play on the road towards the vision for the future. At the same time, it's of great importance that management and managers ensure that there are sufficient resources and that the work demands are balanced with the ability to execute the work tasks and activities. Please take a few moments to consider and reflect on the following questions. How do you provide motivation and stimulation for your employees? Is it possible to increase the experience of meaningfulness, manageability, comprehensibility of the work tasks? Do you use nudging and empowerment? Does everyone in the work team understand how their work tasks and work effort contributes to the goals and vision in the workplace, in the work team, in the organization or enterprise, or in society. Are there possibilities for employees to manage their own areas of responsibility?